Okay, so one nice thing about correlation, uh, the word regression, remember we talked about analysis of variance? Turned out analysis of variance was really a way to compare means, right? It didn't make such sense. You know, it was a way that we could compare means of more than two groups at the same time. We had a t-test, so we can compare means of two groups. But then if we had more than three groups, like say different ethnicities, and we want to find the average uh, 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 blood pressure for different ethnic groups. And we had a sample and there were like 10 different ethnic groups. And we want to compare the mean average, the mean blood pressure for all of those 10 different groups. Uh, there's a problem with doing that all at once, or doing that one at, one at a time with uh, uh, the t-test, right? Because we only compare two means at a time. Uh, with the t-test, that would mean we'd have to repeat it for group one versus group two, group two versus group three, group one versus group seven, so on and so forth. So you have a permutation of 10 times nine times eight and so on and so forth. Number of different t-tests that you'd have to do in order to complete that analysis, right? Well, that's no good for a couple of reasons. One is because it's impractical to do that. Right? Obviously, that's, it's pretty labor intensive. The other reason is because each time you run a t-test, if you're using an alpha 0.05, if that's going to satisfy your result um, uh, in order for you to reject the null hypothesis, each time you do that, you have a 5% chance of being wrong, right? In other words, incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis, doing the terrible type 1 error, right? So, so you don't want to do that. If you keep doing it over and over again, it's like Russian roulette, eventually you're going to get that wrong. So we needed another test to do that. So we used analysis of variance. Sounds like it's worried about variance. It's really comparing. It really uses the variance within groups and between means of the groups to figure out whether or not we can say that the average means are different from one another. So it's really doing the same work as a t-test, except for multiple groups instead of just two groups. Um, similarly, we're working with two words now, uh, correlation and regression. Right. Well, correlation, fortunately, means the same thing in real life as it means for statistics. It means, is there an association between two things? OK, so, for instance, there are spurious correlations, right? There are correlations that, you know, are true, but, you know, they don't really they're not really useful for, you know, like predicting things, understanding things. For instance, uh, one correlation that I might bring up is, is that. There's a correlation between the number of firemen that show up at a fireman and the amount of damage that the fire does. Does that mean that it, that sounds true, right? In other words, if you have one engine show up with five firemen, right, that uh, you'd ex uh, and there's a certain amount of damage. If there were five engines that showed up with 50 firemen, it's bigger fire. It's going to be more damage, right? But you could understand that there's an association there. More firemen, more damage. Does that mean the firemen are causing the damage? No, obviously, right? That's not the case. Although between me and you, I have friends that are firemen. They cause plenty of damage. But that's a whole other issue, right? They don't, they, you know, technically it's really the fire. That's the size of the fire that determines both of those things. But it's a correlation. Both of those are numbers, number of firemen, dollars of damage that are done. Correlation is something that we use to examine two numeric variables. In this case, it's number of firemen and the number of uh, and the dollars that the uh, of damage that the fire does. Okay, so there's a lot of situations where we want to associate two numerical variables. Up to this point, we haven't had a tool to do that. Let's think about the tools that we've learned to use here so far. One of them is the t-test. We're comparing the means of two groups, right? Well, what what kind of variables are we working with? We're working with a nominal variable and we're working with a numerical variable in other words the ca the nominal variable or category is for instance gender male and female right has two values okay so uh, and we're comparing say the uh, uh, test test scores for males and females from a pot in a particular population right so we would be looking at the average test score for males the average test score for females one categorical variable one numerical variable, categorical variable gender, numerical variable the test score. Okay, so we're comparing those two means. So we have a, a mechanism for comparing the means of two groups, right? Uh, given that it's categorical and numerical uh, data. Then last week, uh, which was mostly online, you guys learned about analysis of variance. Analysis of variance, the only difference there is, is that 
it, it, it's doing the same work as the t test but you're learning about but you're comparing the average mean the mean for more than two groups so in other words um uh if our uh, uh, uh if we were examining the uh, uh, uh the uh, amount of money that is spent on books by freshmen sophomores juniors and seniors we have two categories there right we have two uh, variables there we have one variable which is the the class right which is has four values fresh freshman sophomore junior and senior and we have another variable which is the amount of dollars each student spent on their books that year right so now again we're going to compare the mean of freshmen to the mean of sophomores to the mean uh, number dollars spent by juniors and mean dollars spent by seniors problem there is we have four groups we want to compare the means of all of them that for that we use analysis of variance instead of the t-test doing the same work as t-test in fact if you only had two groups if you only examined freshmen and sophomores and you used analysis of, of variance instead of the t-test you'd get exactly the same result for your p-value your probability of being wrong if you reject the null hypothesis they're really and secretly in the background work the same way so we have that next we learned about the categorical variables when well, we're comparing two categorical variables at the at the second half of today we're going to talk about that in detail because a lot of the data that's in the community health survey that flu vaccine uh, uh, that reduced set which uh, 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 addresses flu vaccine and, and uh, several other variables a lot of that information that's in those files in, including the whole the full community health survey a lot of that's information that's in two those files is categorical data so even age they might group ages by 18 to 30 31 to 40 and so on and so forth so that it's, re it's really not really a, a numerical variable it's really a number of groups in that case you might you might look at it as ordinal right but ordinal is just another form of categorical variable anyway so chi-square odds ratio relative risk those are the tools that we use when we can compare two categorical variables in the flu data for instance one cat one variable might be did a person get a flu shot and not get a flu shot that year during that during the past 12 months the other variable might be are they insured yes or no right well okay so categorical variable one categorical variable two you can summarize that in a two rows two table with two rows insurance and no insurance and two columns got a flu shot didn't get a flu shot and then perform a chi-square analysis on that data uh, or an odds ratio on that data on two by two tables you can do odds ratio and relative risk okay, again uh, if you need to refresh your memory on that go back to the video uh, I'm going to do a, a kind of a help session on some of this as well uh, review session on some of this as well online and you know as we move on so so that's a way for us to work with those two that kind of data you could also have a situation where you have different types of insurance okay not only with the, the not only this variable now is type of insurance uh, among people that were insured or even just everybody uh, maybe there's several categories in that variable one might represent no insurance two might represent medicare three might, might represent medicaid four might represent uh, 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 employer insurance five might re represent um, uh, 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 insurance by uh, you know because of a spouse is insured uh, uh, six might represent um, uh, Obamacare, uh, uh, but you purchased uh, uh, insurance on the Obamacare market. So now there's six categories of insurance that you could have. So we have six rows and we have two columns still for got a flu shot, didn't get a flu shot. So we have a six by two table. You can still do chi square with that, right? You might not be able to do odds ratio because you really need a two by two table, as you'll see if you try it with, a, uh, with uh, SPSS but you can still do chi-square to see if there's an association between the type of insurance and the uh, uh and whether or not a person is likely to get a flu shot or not or had gotten a flu shot during that period of time right so we have that tool for categorical categorical well what about when we want to compare numerical data for instance what do we want what if we want to compare uh, uh whether uh, see if there's association between 
age and blood pressure. So we sample a population, we get their age, we get their blood pressure. Those are both numbers. Neither one of them is a category, right? Neither one is male or female or, or uh, old, uh, you know, it's not old or young, it's an actual number. Right. So now how do we examine an association between those two things? Well, that's a special issue that we're dealing with numerical numerical data. That's where we use these tools called correlation and regression. OK, so correlation. First thing with correlation is. Let me open this up. First thing with correlation is, is that, for instance, uh, I'm going to open up one data set here. Let me see if I got it in, in uh, SPSS or Excel. Let me make sure I have it on my desktop. Okay. Okay, let me throw it out to my desktop. I think that I can also get it to open just by doing that. Yep, it'll open. Okay, this is a, a kind of a spurious data set uh, called Pizza versus the Subway Fare. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know that you guys have been exposed to this or not, but there's this old saw in New York City that says that a slice of pizza costs the same thing as a subway fare, no matter how far back you go in New York City. When I was a kid, um uh, uh uh 1960 i was about 10 years old okay uh a slice of pizza cost 15 cents and it cost 15 cents to get on the subway we had a little little tiny tokens some small tokens i think within a year or two went up to a quarter and they gave up the tokens for that quarter you know you just put a quarter in the slot and then a few years later it went up to 35 cents we went to these big fat tokens and so on and so forth but over the years they always used to use tokens these to probably most of you guys I've probably never used the token. Am I am? Am I right about that? Right. So, so anyway, these have these tokens. But as the price of pizza, as the price of subway uh, went up, the price of pizza went up, and it's always been pretty much the same. So today, I'm guessing this was subway fare is two seventy five now, right? And I'm guessing you know if you're a single fan, right? So I'm guessing a pizza slice of pizza now is about two seventy five. Also, I'm not talking about those dollar pizza places, right? I don't know what that is. It's not pizza, but you know. But a normal place like neighborhood pizzeria, you pay like whatever, 18 bucks for an eight slice pizza or something like that. And by the slice, it's probably two and a half or three dollars. So it's still pretty true. It's pretty roughly the same. Does that mean that that the people, the MTA is waiting to see what the pizza prices are to, to make up their fare? No, it's a spurious correlation. It just happens, probably has something to do with inflation more than anything else. But there is an association. It's a real association. So how can I demonstrate what this looks like? In other words, how can I show graphically that there is this association? Well, what I'm going to do is I am going to plot these values. In other words, I'm going to make on an x, y axis a graph. I'm going to say that the price of pizza is 15 cents. I'm going to put the price of pizza down for each point. Price of pizza is going to be my x value. And the subway fare is going to be my y value. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can't do this. Oh, let me see if I can't do this quickly here. I'm going to do it in SPSS, really, but I want to see if I can't do it here also. I'm going to click scatter plot and I'm going to click OK. Okay, and here we go. This is what it looks like, right? In other words, here's 15 cents and 15 cents. Here's uh, when, um, uh, you know, whatever year it was, I didn't include that in my uh, graphics, but uh, this is uh, the year when it was a dollar, each one of them was a dollar. Here uh, in 1995 or something like that, uh, uh, the subway fare was $1.25. I'm sorry, pizza, because pizza was $1.25, subway fare was $1.35, and so on and so forth. What do you notice about this plot? It, it's almost like a straight line, isn't it? It's not a perfect straight line, but it's close to a straight line. That is a high degree of correlation. That's what we would cor call correlation. In other words, that there's an association between the cost of pizza and the subway fare. I didn't say that one causes the other. I just said that there's an association. So I might say, if we're going to talk statistics, you know, I'm going to create a null hypothesis. I'd say, Null hypothesis, there's no association between the cost of pizza 
and the cost of a subway fare. My alternative would be is that there is an association. So this looks like, you know, this looks like pretty strong evidence that there is an association. And maybe I can reject my null hypothesis that there's no association. No, I need to justify that, right? So I need to introduce, unfortunately for us, some actual math into this whole thing, right? Uh, uh, sad, but true. So we need a way of describing how strong an association this is, how good a correlation this is, and whether or not we have enough data to see, say that that correlation is real and it's not due to chance, so I can reject my null hypothesis, okay? So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna open this same file in SPSS, and we're gonna run a analysis called Pearson's chi-square, Pearson's correlation coefficient. What is that? Pearson's correlation coefficient is I'm going to first get, get into SPSS and I'll, we'll discuss that since I want to illustrate it for you. Okay, let's see. Let me open up SPSS. While it's opening up, any questions so far about this idea of correlation? Nope, we're okay with that. Right, it's pretty basic. It makes sense, right? Come on. There we go. Good. Open data. I've put this on my desktop, I hope. Where's my desktop? Users. And my desktop. Come on. It's not. I thought I did. There it is. I don't know why I couldn't find it there, but I'll open it this way. Works just as good. And this finally does open sometime today. You'll see that the same data I had in that file is here. The year, the uh, pizza, the subway, these are all numerical variables. Right? Well, this is a categorical variable. The year is categorical. But the cost of pizza, cost of a subway fare, or are both numerical data. I want to look for an association. So I'm going to do exactly what I just did with uh, uh, Excel, with Excel, I'm going to plot it in a graph. I'm going to go to graphs. There's a lot of different ways in SPSS, as you got, if you guys have been playing around with it, hopefully, that you've seen. You can use this thing called Chart Builder. It's kind of like you know a, a macro walks you through it, and so on and so forth. But for old geezers like me, they have the legacy dialogues, where you can just go directly to the type of graph that you want to create. The one that we're going to create is an XY plot with dots on it. Right? That's a scatter called a scatter dot. I'm going to just say simple scatter dot, and I'm going to say define. And I'm going to now tell it what to put into the x-axis, what variable to put into the y-axis. We're looking at the two variables, uh, cost of pizza, cost of uh, subway fare, right? So now which one, you know, right now in correlation, remember I told you when we talk about correlation, we're not concerned about causation. So it doesn't matter which one I put in the x-axis, which one I put in the y. When we talk about regression, making a judgment about which one is the predictor of the other, which one is the independent variable, which one is a dependent variable, depends on the value of the other, that's going to make a difference to us. So for right now, it doesn't matter which one I put in there. However, let's say, just for practice, I'm going to say that the MTA orders out for lunch once a year when they have their big meeting on whether to raise the fare or not. And depending on what the pizza costs at that lunch is what determines the fare for the coming year, right? Um, I, that may not be so far from the truth. So I'm gonna put in this slice of pizza into the x-axis. That's my independent variable, right? And I'm gonna put the subway fare into the dependent variable. The cost of the subway fare is determined by or influenced by the cost of pizza that year. 
So, okay, I'm going to just, that's enough for now. I'm not going to worry, worry about titles and stuff like that. I'm going to produce that graph. And SPSS does the same thing that we did in Excel, and it produces the same, basically the same graph as we saw in Excel. You can, each one of these points represents the X and Y axis cost of, cost of pizza and the cost of a, uh, 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 and the cost of a subway token or subway fare for that year. So I'm, I can actually double click into this to modify this. And one of the things that I can ask SPSS to do is to create a line that, that predicts a best fit for the points that I see there, a straight line that best estimates the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, where these points are. Some of these points wind up right on that straight line, right? There's one almost exactly on that straight line. Other points are above it, others are below it. The closer these values are to the straight line, the more of a perfect correlation that this is. Is there such a thing as a perfect correlation? Well, yeah, like BMI, height and weight, right? BMI is determined by height and weight, so it's always going to be, per, you know, height and weight is going to always predict BMI because it's, it's calculated, right? Occasionally, you might find some other things that are perfect correlations. Most of the time, things are not perfect correlations. Some, most of the time, not even, things are not even great correlations or good correlations, but they're, they have some, some effect on each other. In this case, this is a really good correlation. Well, what kind of number are we going to create to measure how good a correlation this is? That's going to be called, uh, that, that's, we're going to use the symbol R, lowercase r, to represent that. That's going to be called Pearson's correlation coefficient, or lowercase r. Okay, and the way that that's de determined, it's determined by the amount of the, once you've determined this, this perfect line, this best fit line, which is a line that balances the square of the difference between what that line would represent them. For instance, when the cost of a slice of pizza was $2, this is what the subway fare should have been. But it was actually this number, okay, if, if you look at the best fit line. So what it's going to try and do is going to try and balance this so that the squares of the values above the distance of the values from the line to the values that it misses above are equal to the squares of the values that it misses below. Okay, so in other words, it's going to do that calculation. And then it's going to look at how, how much these values, these differences, these errors above and below vary from the, uh, 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 from the actual values themselves. It's going to look at the amount of volatility or variability, right? And it's going to create a ratio, this R value. The bigger the variability that you have there, right, the closer that the R value is going to be to zero. The closer these values are to that predicted line, the closer the R value is going to be to the number one. So you have a range of values you can have for R. R can be anything from zero to one. Zero means there's no association between these two variables. One means that there's a perfect association, a perfect correlation. One of them can absolutely predict the other one. Right, so this is a pretty high correlation that we're going to get here. We're going to use. Uh, I'm not going to. We're not going to do this by hand. We're going to depend on SPSS to do this. Whenever we do this calculation, you'll see the real formulas in the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of summarizing, twisting, simplifying. You know the process. This process, but we'll see the real formulas when we see the core, when we see the PowerPoint. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. This is pretty close to a perfect correlation, but it's not perfect. I'm going to guess before we do the analysis in SPSS, I'm going to guess that this correlation has an R value, Pearson's correlation, of 0.9. Okay, that's close to one, right? That's since it's close to one, it suggests that it's a very good correlation. If it were 0.1, it would suggest that it's not a very good correlation, right? So. So, uh, and these numbers would be scattered all over the place, and the line that we drew would be in the middle somewhere, but it wouldn't help. Okay, so now, you know, actually, I lied a little bit there. You could actually have a value from negative one to positive one, zero meaning no correlation. What do you think a, a correlation of negative one would mean instead of a, instead of a correlation of plus one? 
negative correlation, right? In other words, as the price of pizza went up, the price of a subway fare went down. Wouldn't that be good? That would be wonderful, right? Unfortunately, that's not the case, right? So, so well, some of us eat pizza more than they take subway, so it might not be good for them. So at any rate, so that would be a negative correlation. And the slope of this line, instead of being upwards, would be downwards, right? Same idea. Closer you get to negative one, the better correlation is. So it's really that number, not so much its sign. The sign determines whether it's a positive correlation, they both go up, or if a negative correlation, they both go down. But the value of that number, how close it is to one, is what determines the uh, correlation. So I'm going to actually go ahead and do this correlation. Okay, and how do we do that next in SPSS? Analyze, correlate. Simple enough, right? And bivariate. Why bivariate? Two variables, right? We're only going to use this right now for two variables. In this case, pizza and subway fare. Okay, so now it's asking me to put the variables into this box. So I move in the course of a slice of pizza. Notice it won't let me click OK. Then I move into the subway fare. Now it's got two, bit, two numerical variables to work with, so it'll let me go ahead with this. Notice that it's a single box. doesn't matter what order I put these in. Right? Remember, correlation does not imply causality. Right? That's something we're saving for regression. This is just to look to see if there's an association. And notice Pearson's Pearson, correlation coefficient, Pearson's is checked off. There. I'll click OK, and it'll do the calculation for us. And here's our table. And the result of our table is that the correlation between the cost of a slice of pizza and the subway fare is 0.993. Right, it's, it's even tighter than I thought it, closer to one than I thought it was going to be. The, the correlation between the cost of a slice of pizza and the cost of a slice of pizza is one. It's the same numbers, right? SPSS is constantly doing, going through all the permutations when it gives you output and stuff like that. But you really didn't know, need to do, no, cost of a slice of pizza and the cost of a slice of pizza are a perfect correlation. They're the same numbers, right? If you, it, it also repeats it. These uh, subway fare, what's the correlation with a slice of pizza, which is just turning them upside down, doing it in the opposite order. It's the same number. Okay, so this number, Pearson's correlation, tells us how good a correlation is, how tight it is to that line. The second number, significance, gives you the probability that that correlation is due to chance and not because it's a real correlation. So... The R value, if there's no correlation, the R value would be zero. So there's a couple of ways we can phrase our null hypothesis here. Remember I said before, well, null hypothesis, no association, no correlation between these two values, okay? And there is an association between these two values, but null and alternative hypothesis. A better way is, that if you're a statistician, the way that you would phrase that null and alternative hypothesis, R is equal to zero is our null hypothesis. R is not equal to zero is our alternative hypothesis. Could be equal to 0.1, which means, gee, not a very good correlation, right? However, statistically significant, right? That could be significantly good. So in this case, we have a very good correlation, and look at the significance. It's less than 0.05. So there's a less than 5% chance that this correlation, which is not zero, is not due to chance. So we can reject our null hypothesis, as long as that's less than 0.05. Now, the correlation could have been 0.1. What would that represent? That would represent the line is not, you know, there's spots, there's, there's points all over the place, the line's in the middle, but, you know, it, you know, it doesn't really look like, you know, very much correlation, right? However, you could still find a significant difference. It may not be a practical difference, practical correlation, but it may be statistically significant, right? On the other hand, if we had very little data, you could have gotten a correlation of 0.9, but then it might not be significant statistically because you didn't have enough data for some other reason or something like that. Okay, so that's correlation. That's how we're going to use correlation. I'm going to ask you guys to download a file called, uh, yeah, 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 let's see, let's see. Okay. Download a, a file called violentcrime.sav. That's on Blackboard, weekly materials. Um, uh, you can also watch me work on this as well. I'm going to open this up in SPSS. And we're going to look for a correlation. First thing we're going to do is we're going to examine the data 
because everything we do with the data is based on what kind of data is it? It's a data type, it's a numerical, it's a categorical, and so on and so forth. You can just say yes to that Unicode warning. It's an older data file in a newer version of SPSS. That's why it does that stuff. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to examine the, the data files I have. I'm gonna go into the variable view. In the variable view, I can see that almost all of the data here is numerical data. And what is that data? That data is violent crime. That's the rate of violent crime, the murder rate, uh, the poverty rate, high school graduation rate, the college, uh, 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 college rate, the uh, uh, pr proportion of uh, families that are single parent households, the unemployment rate, and whether, whether or not it's a metropolitan in or urban community. Okay, in other words, uh, the size, it's relative size of it, I guess, right? But if you look at that, I went back to the data view. If you look at that, all of these are, cat are numerical variables, right? No, the unemployment rate, the uh, percentage of people that graduate high school, the poverty rate, but they're all organized by state. That's our categorical variable, it's by state. So what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at whether or not there's an association, um, a violent crime rate is probably the number of violent crimes per 100,000 people uh, during the course of a year. Okay, murder rate is this, poverty rate. Let's see, uh, we can pick out any of these things. I'm gonna say, let's see if there's an association between the poverty rate and the rate and the murder rate. Okay, let's use that one. Okay, let's see if there's an association. For the moment, we're only interested in correlation, right? So in order to get a look at this, let's go up here to analyze, excuse me, graphs, legacy dialogues, and scatter dot. Okay, I'll wait for you guys to do it. Then choose scatter dot, simple scatter, simple scatter, define, and then move those two variables, the murder rate and the poverty rate, into your box and then say, okay, see what you wind up getting. It doesn't get, move it into the X and the Y axis. It doesn't, make doesn't matter, right? Remember, correlation, we don't care, right? We're just looking to see which one, uh, which one causes which. If you want, you could say to yourself, you know, I don't think the murder rate causes people to be poor, so maybe I'll, I'll put poverty into the X axis, the predictor, and put murder rate into the Y axis. Because right? maybe that's what we're interested in. What we're interested in seeing if higher poverty rates lead to more murders. Okay, so I'll give you guys a second to do that on your own. Go ahead, go ahead and say okay and plot the graph. So before I do it, does it look like there's an association? No? Let me take a look. Sometimes it's a little hard to see this graphically because. Well, gee, look at this. It's, they're all clumped up down there at the bottom. Well, what is this thing over here? There's an outlier, right? right? There's an outlier where the poverty rate was 17.5%, but the murder rate was gigantic, right? Uh, uh, 40, whatever it is, 40 something, right? All the way up here, that's an outlier. I wonder what data that is. I'm going to go back here. I'm going to take a look. Which one has such a high murder rate? Ah, District of Columbia. Aha, uh -huh. that's not even a state, right? There's a very high murder rate. We have an outlier. It's distorting the data because it's so, we can only, our graph only shows that. There's, all the others are much lower rates. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to remove that. I'm going to go up to, I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to go to edit and clear. And it's going to take the District of Columbia out. Now I could do other things. I could filter it. I could tell it to, I could identify it as an outlier, leave the data in there. I'm just doing this because it's just simple and quick. Okay, now I'm gonna do my scatter dot again. Graphs, legacy dialogues, scatter dot, define. It's already, already set up there and then I'm gonna click okay. Okay, let's look at our new, oh, my new graph looks quite different, doesn't it? You know. I can see, look, there. it seems like they're going up, 
Not very strong correlation, but it seems like they're going up. I'm going to double click on that. And I'm going to ask it, if you, if you take a look up here, you can hover. If you hover over these, if I double click on the graph, it gives me a chart editor. Uh, all the way on the second line, all the way over to the right, you'll notice that there's a bunch of little mini graphs. One of them says, add a fit line. I'm going to click on that one. And it adds a fit line for us. And that's that best fit line that we were talking about. You can close that now, and it'll be transferred to the graph behind it. That fit line that you see there does that balancing act for us, right? Does that balancing act of distributing the differences above with the differences below, so it's represented by a straight line. Now, all of these points are uh, not, or, or, uh, you know, only a few points land right on that line, right? But the others are pretty spread out different spots, right? So now I'm going to ask you this. First of all, number one, uh, when I do the Pearson's correlation now, calculate that R value, right? Uh, is it going to be a positive number or a negative number? Which direction is it sloping? Sloping upwards, right? So it's going to be a positive number. And you know it's going to be a number between 0 and 1, positive number between 0 and 1. Last time we had a number 0 0.9. You guys think that's going to be lower than 0 0.9? Yeah, quite a bit lower because it's not as good an association. Let's actually go ahead and do that. Analyze correlate bivariate again because two variables okay and now we're going to move in murder rate and poverty and we're going to go ahead appear make sure pearson's is checked off and we're going to say okay okay so what'd you get for the correlation 0.427 right well, well it's not as good as we had before but there is, we can see there is some association between the two of them. So what's our null hypothesis here? In English, our null hypothesis is there's no association between the poverty rate and the murder rate. Well, you know, we saw that scatter plot. It looked like there was a little bit of an association at least, right? We ran our, our, our value. And sure enough, there, it, it says that there's an association. Our alternative hypothesis is that there's no association. Uh, that there is that there is an association, right? Reject the null hypothesis that there's no association. In statistical speak, our null hypothesis is R is equal to zero, no association, no hypothesis. Or alternative hypothesis, R is not equal to zero, it's equal to something other than zero. Well, right here, it tells us that R is equal to 0.427 for this data, right? Not, not uh, uh, every case ever, right, for this data. It's equal to 0.427. How do I know whether that number, that 0.427, is due to chance or it's actually a real association, right? Well, we look for the significance, the probability that we would get this large, this extreme of value if the null hypothesis were true. It's very low. It's only two tenths of one percent. There's less than 5% chance that we would get this result if the null hypothesis were true. Right? In other words, there's less than 5% chance we'd be wrong if we reject the null hypothesis. So do we reject the null hypothesis? Yeah, we do, right? right? Because that's less than 0.05. Is everybody comfortable with that so far? Right? Are we? Yes? No? Give me a little feedback here. Okay. We're okay with this? Okay, good. All right, good. It's not that hard, right? I mean, you, you know, use SPSS is doing all the heavy lifting here. If we had had the result, now let's say that we had had the result that that was Pearson's correlation were 0 0.9. 0 0.9, that's a very good association. However, the significance came out to be 0 0.07, right? Not less than 0 0.05. We couldn't reject the null hypothesis even though it looked like there was a good correlation. Right? So you got these two things have to work together. Well, this is, this is nice that we can do this, that we have this tool for looking for an association between two numerical variables. Right? And we could have gone back here to our data file, and we could have looked to see if the high school graduation rate had an impact on, on uh, violent crime. If uh, the percentage of single parent households 
households in the state has an impact on the poverty level in that state, right? I'll bet you it does, right? Maybe we'll do that next, right? Now, the deal here now is, is that these are all numerical variables. We could do a lot of different things with that. We could examine, for, we can look for correlations between these things uh, uh, constantly. I'm gonna take this, uh, I'm gonna do this now again for single parent household and poverty rate. Okay, let's see if being as part of a single parent household affects the rate of poverty. Anybody ever listened to, uh, uh, there's a guy on NPR that's on every afternoon. He does this shtick with like people getting out of debt and stuff like that. Am I the only one who listens to the radio here? This radio? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Yeah, he's like in the, he's on in the afternoon from like three to, I, I, I listen, I wind up listening to him quite a bit because I'm waiting for Neil deGrasse Tyson to come on with Star Talk and stuff like that. And he's on just before Star Talk. But he has this thing where he goes through the, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, different statistics and how you can get out of debt and so on and so forth. He has a whole program. You can join the program. And a lot of this is distributed. A lot of his, his training sessions, so on and so forth, are, are, are operated through churches. So he has a whole religious aspect Dave to the Ramsey. show as well. What's that? That's him, Dave Ramsey. Exactly right. He has a whole religious aspect to the show. And he was talking about you know, like this, some very interesting statistics that that uh, 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 you could predict the likelihood of someone being uh, being in poverty based on a lot of social things. Like, for instance, if you if you uh, 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 if you graduate from school, get married. I mean, there were four things. Graduate from school, get a job, get married, have children. In that order, that you're 97 percent of the time, you will not be in uh, poverty. Where if you get them out of order, it, each one of them increases. The, now I'm not trying to make a social statement here. He's looked at these statistics, right? And this is his view of this the whole thing. But at any rate, but I, you know, there's a lot. So when I look at single parent household. That's one of the things that he he highlights as potentially something that you know will, will get in the way of your financial security, right? So single parent household and poverty. Let's take a look at our data and see if there's an association. But the first thing I'm going to do is look for a correlation. So you guys do it. Go ahead, show me. Uh, could do a scatter plot uh, for. Notice we worry we got rid of the. Um, uh, we we could actually put. DC back in here, I'm not going to bother because it was really the murder rate that was, you know, uh, uh, an outlier, not the other stuff. But that's okay. We don't need it right now anyway. So go ahead and make a graph, a scatter plot graph. I'll give you a, a, a minute or two. And let me know, does it look like there's an association between the two? If you remember to how to edit the graph and put that fit line in there, as well. I'll, I'll, you do it first. You try it. Go in there and give it a try. Just double click on the graph once you get it. And the window will come up. Yes. Single parent household and poverty. Okay. So in other words, each one of these represents for that state what the rates are. So for some states, Illinois, 21.9% uh, of the families there are single parent households. And their poverty rate was 10.5%. And so on. In uh, Louisiana, 29.3% of the uh, fa uh, families are uh, single parent households. What's low? If it's a low one. Utah, 13.6% are single parent households. Why is that? They're all Mormons, right? Yeah, some of the families out there have multiple. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, I don't know if they, it's no longer legal in Utah, but I'm sure it goes on still. But yeah, yeah. Okay, so when you get to the graph, double click the graph. That that uh, editing window will come up. Go all the way over on the second row of of icons. Go all the way over to the right. Hover over those little graph symbols. And one of them will say fit line. And just click on that, it'll put a fit line down. Then you can close the editing window and even close the graph. 
that pops up and, and it'll fall behind and show you that. Yes. You did the opposite city. The axes are reserved. However, the line will will also it will you still go the same direction, up or down. Yeah. Uh, are no kidding. That I'm kind of surprised at that. Let me let me take a look at this. Analyze. Uh, did one of you not eliminate the Washington D.C. Maybe. Did you remove Washington D.C.? No, she removed it. You didn't remove it. So that's the reason why they're different. Yeah, look for the state names in Washington, D.C. See if Washington, D.C. is. Because we removed it because of an outlier on the murder rate. Yeah, you don't have to remove it. It's okay. She removed it. Let me give it a try. Okay, so I'm going to go scatter dot. I'm going to simple scatter dot. Did you actually do the R value yet? Not the formulas, not the R value. Oh, you did it? Okay, I'm going to click OK. Let's see what I get. Okay, I get this graph, right? I'm going to double click into it, just say, see if, see if it give me, gives me a nice line. Oops. Where did it, where did it go? I'll double click into it again. Here we go. And fit line. Okay. Okay, so it looks like I have a positive correlation. You can see it behind me, right? Looks like I got a positive correlation. And if I go to my, if I, if I calculate R, the R value, analyze, correlate, bivariate, and now I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to put in the uh, poverty level. Where is poverty? Violent crime, college, single parent household. Oh, I already have poverty. Yeah, single parent household. I'm going to click OK. We you got poverty and single parent household, right? OK. So I wind up getting a correlation of 0.453, right? Let me do it the other way, see if I get a different number. Correlate. Oops. Ah, the wrong thing there. Analyze. Correlate. Bivariate. I'm going to reverse these. Okay, I'm going to put it back in. Do it again. I got the same one. I got the same number. Whether I put whether I put poverty first or whatever or uh, did you did you let me just go back up here. Analyze, correlate, bivariate. Right. Um, uh, single parent and poverty are moved over to the right. Does it make it the no, the order shouldn't make a difference. Right. Right. We'll take a closer look at it later. Okay, I just did it both ways. I reversed them, and I got the same number. Okay, so what do I got here? Okay, so what do we got here? The correlation is 0.453, right? Similar to the other correlation we got. And the uh, uh, significance is less than 0.05. So I can reject the null hypothesis that there's no association and say, gee, there is an association. States that have higher rates of single parent families have higher rates of poverty as well, right? Seems causal. Now let's say they, we had this data, you know, I just got a thing in the mail. I don't know anybody else got this as well, that I am part of the Commerce Department uh, 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 household survey or something like that. And now I got to go online and fill, it's part of the census. Right, it's, it's like some precursor to the census. I got to go online and fill all kinds of stuff out and give more kinds of information. And if I don't do this, they're going to send me a paper form and have somebody knock on my door and stuff like that. So I better do it if I don't want to visit. Right. So, so I just got this in the mail, like literally uh, 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 a week ago. Right. So I, you guys are lucky, I guess. You haven't gotten it yet. Right. But you will be hit by this. over the next over the next twelve months. You definitely are going to be at some stage, have some sort of connection with the Census Bureau and the Commerce Department. Right? But that, that's coming. You can look forward to that. So at any rate, and now being statisticians, you're going to be very interested in this data. That What kind of data are they collecting? What, what, what does their survey look like? How are they doing this? Right. So it's going to be, I, I think, take a look at it from the eye of somebody that's, that uh, understands a little bit of statistics. Okay, so this is very interesting. There's an association. 
let's say for argument's sake that um, uh, uh, Idaho didn't have the resources this year to do their survey. And, you know, we know what the single number of single parent households are in Idaho. You know, they were able to do that part of it, but we don't know what the poverty rate is, right? Can we use this information to predict the poverty rate in Idaho, right? Or to predict it for another state or next year or something like that? Can we use this as a pre, in some predictive capacity? And the answer to that is yes, right? That's one of the, that's one of the reasons why we're interested in looking at correlations. We're gonna use a tool called regression, okay? And in regression, what we're gonna do is we are gonna take that line that we just drew on that scatter plot. And we're gonna say that that line represents the relationship between the poverty rate and the murder rate, or in the other case of the other analysis, the poverty rate. Uh, I said, did I do poverty rate and murder rate? I thought I did the, uh, oh, I, I, you know, my scatter plot was wrong. I did the wrong, I moved the wrong variables into my scatter plot. Let me try this again. You get the murder rate added there and put in the, uh, uh, I'll put this out. Also put in household, poverty. You guys didn't catch me on that. I did the right thing on the, uh, on the analysis, but not here. Oh yeah, look at it. Much nicer then, okay. Okay, oops, give me the output window back. Good, there we are. Okay, so I want to use this analytically. I want to use this predictively this line. This line represents the relationship between single parent house to households. The percent, as the percentage goes up, the rate of poverty in that state goes up as well. I want to use it predictively. Okay, so in order to do this, that line, we know from math, if we want to, you know, this is, I mean, it's ancient history now that I'm talking about here now. We know when we took algebra, right? We remember algebra, right? Greek, that Greek guy, algebra, right? Remember that? We know from algebra. I'm going to write this in the way that I learned in algebra to write a line, a, a formula for a straight line. Y is equal to MX plus B. Statisticians, they kind of like, they kind of bend that formula. And they say y is equal to a plus bx. A lot of times, there's some form of that, right? So, but at any rate, you can see it's the same thing. mx, bx, same thing. A, you know, they just use the, the letters to represent the same thing. Anybody remember what m stands for? What is m? That's the slope of the line, right? Okay, and what does b represent? That's where it crosses the y-axis, that's the y-intercept. In other words, let's see, 1 to 10, 1 to 20, got a point here, got a point here. Here's our line. I'm going to make believe it goes through there, right? This line might have us, this, this formula for this line might be y is equal to, let's see, when it goes up 10, it goes up 20, the change in y over the change in x is 20 over 10 is two. So the slope is two. So the formula for this line would be y is equal to two times x, two times what x is, plus the y-intercept. So what's the y-intercept? It's where x is zero or the, you cross the y-axis. And that's, let's say that happens to be two, right, positive two. So that formula is equal to two x plus two. That formula defines this line. Since we know the slope and we know at least one point that goes through, can't be another line, right? It, this line has exactly the same slope, but the y-intercept is different. So all we need is this to define a straight line. So for our straight line that we just drew here, what are these values? The slope and the intercept, what are those values? We're going to calculate those now. We're going to use something called regression. Unfortunately, the word regression has nothing to do with what we're going to do now. 
right? The, the word regression came from the guy who invented this kind of analysis. He was working on um, uh, 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 evaluating uh, offspring of, say, to, you know, he was working with plants, with people, and so on and so forth. He was working on evaluating if two very tall parents have a child, is that child likely to be the same height as them, taller or shorter than they are? And as it happens, because the, the average height for the population, by some chance, whatever chance, their genes combine to make them very tall. But they also carry genes for people in their family that are shorter as well, right? Uh, they may be buried in there somewhere, but they're in there as well. As it happens, you have two tall parents, the chances are that their offspring are more likely to be a little bit shorter than they are, rather than the same height or taller. He termed that regression to the mean. In other words, when you have extremes that are combined, then the result tends to move towards the mean. Maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, but it tends to regress the mean. In the process, he developed this technique, right? So that's where the regret, where regression comes from. You can forget everything I said in the last few minutes. Last time you, you don't really care about that, right? But uh, the regression, uh, don't try and use uh, to figure that word in terms of you know what you're actually doing here. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to use the same data that we just used here. I'm going to say analyze. I'm going to go down to pass correlate to regression. I'm going to go into linear regression. Why linear regression? Because we believe this relationship to be linear. Not all relationships are linear. Some relationships are logarithmic. Some exp exponential. You know, as uh, something you know, as something as one thing gets bigger, the other one gets much bigger. You know, very rapidly and so on and so forth. That would be exponential. We believe these relations, most of the relationships we're going to work with, we believe them probably going to be linear until we figure, you know, until we look at it more closely and maybe we decide maybe they're not linear. Maybe we can't make that judgment, right? But for the moment, we're going to talk about only linear regression, right? Only looking at this relationship as a line. I'm going to click on linear and it's going to come up. Now, notice instead of a single box, now I got two boxes. One box is for the independent variable. The other box is for the dependent variable. Don't uh, first think first about the dependent variable, which is the one that's determined by the other, right? So it seems to me more likely that the poverty rate is going to be determined by the single parent, the percentage of single parent households, rather than the other way around, right? Being uh, you know uh, uh, being a state with a lot of poor people. Maybe not doesn't mean that necessarily a lot of single parent households, but let's say the poverty rate is the dependent variable. The you can also call that the explained variable. The explaining variable is going to be the sing, the percentage of single parent households. We also call that the independent variable. It's independent, but it's affecting the value of the poverty rate. So that's each state. Okay, so. I'm going to go into statistics and click into statistics. And it's already telling me regression coefficients, estimates. I'm just going to leave it at that. And uh, if you go into plots, you get a scatter plot and so on and so forth. But for right now, all I'm interested in doing the basic analysis, that estimate. So I'm going to click OK. My output window is going to come up. And the first thing that happens in my output window is I have a model summary. That model summary tells me what the R correlation coefficient is. They use a capital R. Almost everybody else is, 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 uses lowercase r. They say that R is equal to 0.453. We know that already. We just did that, right? That's the correlation. That's what we just calculated, right? That R value is the correlation, just as we did it before. So, but in this case, we're looking for a bit more. We are defining one as causing the other. And we want to know what's that formula for that line, that best fit line that describes this relationship. Okay, well, the second table we see is analysis of variance. It looks just like we had with ANOVA. It looks at the variability of the differences and the variability of values and so on and so forth. And it gives us a probability that we would be wrong if we reject the null hypothesis that, that this is not a valid regression or that there's no correlation here, right? So that's less than 0.01. So we can proceed 
because we can we can say that this is a real correlation. It also gives you a value called R squared. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on why or how we arrive at this conclusion, but R squared is just 0.453 times 0.453. There's other ways to calculate R squared that come up with basically the same number, right? You get, uh, just taking R and squaring it, that's one way to do it. There's a few other ways to do it as well. That R square value, that tells you what percentage of the variability in the predicted variable is ex uh, in the uh, uh, predicted variable is explained by the predictor. In other words, how, how good the, the uh, single parent household level is it predicting the variability in the poverty rate between these states? So 20% of the variability in the poverty rate is explained by the percentage of single parent household. Well, that tells you two things. It tells you one thing that 20% is explained. It doesn't tell you where the other, how the other 80% of the variability is explained. There are many other factors that uh, determine the, the uh, uh, poverty rate in the state. This is just one of them. But there's many others. Okay. So, so in this case, 20% of the variability is explained. That's something. Not great, but it's something, right? So, so if we go down finally, the last table we got is coefficients. These coefficients refer to the coefficients that are the slope and the y-intercept for our graph for our line. Okay, if you look at this constant, this one marked constant under B, unstandardized coefficient, that B is the y-intercept. The single parent is the, is the slope of the line. Uh, that's our B, uh, that's our B, our slope of the line. It's 0.438. So what does that mean to our line? That means, let me go back here. That means let me squeeze this together here so I can see it at the same time I'm writing. Okay, and uh, okay, so that means that our line. Let's see. Something like this. Our line y equals a plus bx. Well, that formula really now becomes y is equal to the y intercept, which is 1.379 plus b, which is uh, uh, the slope 0.438 times the value of these uh, percentage of single parent families. I'll put sp. So what is y again? Y is the poverty rate is equal to 1.34, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll round it off, plus 0.44 times the single parent rate. So if we know this rate of the percentage of single parents, we can use that to predict the poverty rate. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, make up a state. I'm gonna say uh, we just, uh, we just brought Puerto Rico into the, there's a, still, still a, uh, you know, but I was down in Puerto Rico about 30 years ago. And there were so maybe even a little longer, maybe 40 years ago, 35, 40 years ago. There was a lot of turmoil there because there were a number, there was a movement for independence. There was a movement for statehood. There was a movement for not doing anything, right? And there was a lot of violence associated with that. In the United States, Puerto Rican terrorists planted bombs around the city. They planted bombs in France, a Francis Tavern downtown in downtown Manhattan that uh, destroyed part of the tavern and killed three or four people. And there were people in, in prison in the United States for that bombing for a number of years. And eventually were, uh, the sentences were commuted by one of the presidents. But at any rate, anybody know the significance of Francis Tavern? No, it's a historic site. Francis Tavern is where General Washington gave his farewell to the troops after the revolutionary. See, you know, a lot of crap in this course that has nothing to do with statistics, right? And there was actually a movement like that. So let's say Puerto Rico to next tomorrow becomes a state, right? 
they don't have any statistics on the poverty rate, but they do have statistics on the sing, no, percentage of single parent households. Let's say Puerto Rico has 10% of the population uh, is a single parent house, is in a single parent household, right? So how would we predict what the poverty rate is? Well, we'd say the poverty rate is equal to 1.38 times 0.44. I'm gonna make it 20%, make it more in line with the, uh, with the uh, general population, uh, 0.20. I don't know. I don't remember how these numbers look here. Let me go back to the data to make sure I'm using the same units. Uh, 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 let's see. Okay. So poverty rate is single parent rate is a is a it's not a percent. It's not point. Uh, not 0.20, it's 2 to duo, right? And the poverty rate is also a number like that. Okay, so uh, it's not 2 it's 20. So I'm gonna put in here. I wanna use the same units as we did before. It's 20%, not 0.20, okay? 0.44 times 0.20. So what's the power, what do we predict the poverty rate in Puerto Rico to be? 1.38 plus uh, 8.8. Am I right about that? Two times that is 88.88. Move this way, 0.88. Right. So the poverty rate in Puerto Rico, we estimate it to be 8, 1, 10.18, 10.2, I'm going to call it. 10.2 is what we predict the poverty rate to be. Okay. How good an estimate is that? Well, the fact that only 20% of the variability is due to the single parent household, and the fact that the correlation was only 0.4 something, right, and R squared was only 0.2, right, it's probably not all that accurate, right? But it gives us, it, it's a way for us to at least have some insight into what it's likely to be, right? That's how we're using, that's how we're using regression differently from correlation. They're, they're, buddies, they're buddies, but one of them has a little bit more power, has a little bit more useless, usefulness than the other one does. That's the poverty rate, 10.2, right? Do we know what it really is? Well, the only way we're gonna know what it really is is to, is to go and do a census in Puerto Rico and determine the poverty rate, okay? However, you know what we can do? I'm gonna go up, get to our data again, say analyze. I'm gonna take a break right after I do this because I can see you guys kind of drifting. Analyze. I'm not immune to that. I notice, you know, <laughs> I'm going to go to regression. I'm going to go back to linear, except this time I'm going to click on this little button that says save over here. And I'm going to ask it to give me the predicted values. Uh, unstandardized and standardized. And residuals unstandardized and unstandardized. I'm going to click continue. I'm going to say, okay, again, and I'm gonna look at my output table. My output table is gonna look pretty much the same. There's an extra box in there that I'm kind of interested in, but not right now. But if I go back to my data, all of a sudden there's two new columns in my data. Those two columns are my predicted values and my residual values. In other words, my predicted value is the poverty rate based on the percentage of single parent households using that formula. So in this in this first state, whatever it was, Alabama, the rate of uh, single parents in households is 26% and the poverty rate was 14%, 14.7%. If I apply my formula to a percentage of 26% for the single parent rate, I it, my formula would predict that the poverty rate was 12 point whatever. 12.76, 12.8%, right? I got it, I was off, right? I, I predicted it was gonna be pretty high, but I was still off. This number, the residual, is the difference between the two of them. That's the error, right? That's the error for each one of these. So my just using my formula, this is what I predict for each one of them, right? So in other words, in some cases, uh, like here, for this value, for Kansas, right? Let me move this over, I think it's Kansas. For Kansas, now, is that the one I want? Yeah, for Kansas, my formula predicted 
a poverty rate of 10.2, and the actual poverty rate was 10.5. That's very close. Others, I'm pretty far off. Idaho, for instance. You know, I predicted nine point something, and it actually came out to be 13.3. There may be other that, uh, things going on in Idaho, not to mention at least there may be no jobs or something like that. This is old data. This is very old data because Idaho might be doing very well right now because they're one of the states, I think, where they're getting the economy boosted by fracking and stuff like that. Right? So there may be a lot more, a lot less poverty there now. So at any rate, these I can calculate these for all of these different values. Interesting thing about the residuals, these errors. If we plot these errors, we want to see that the plot shows that these errors are random, that the, the lower poverty rate, the lower percentage, states with the lower percentages of single parent households aren't all underestimated. And at the other end, the higher values are, uh, of a single parent household aren't all overestimated. In other words, the errors all across the, the, uh, uh, our line, the er errors, the distribution of errors all across our particular line is pretty much random because we don't want some kind of weird effect going on. That would be an indication of something weird going on with our data. So just so you know about it, I'm not, not going to ask you uh, anywhere to figure this out. So, okay, so now uh, exam three for the guys that are online that take the course online. We're taking exam three. Or if you have a particular reason for taking exam three, like you have to be back home in, in uh, uh, Bordeaux, you know, by Christmas and you can't be here or something like that, you, you have to leave now. Uh, uh, if you have a reason for that, if you're taking exam D and you guys online, uh, uh, if you take a course online, um, if you take exam three, it's gonna cover uh, analysis of variance, which was the recorded session last week, and a little bit of this. So there'll probably be two problems on it. One for analysis variance, one for this. Um, uh, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of time to cover this stuff. So I'm gonna structure it so that uh, the online people can take the exam twice. First time they can take it, it'll tell them what they got right and what they got wrong, but not the right answers. And then they can take it again. So th they'll have maybe three days that they can fit those into. They got to do it at one sitting, start the exam, it logs out two hours later, and uh, so on and so forth. So you guys are going to, you guys that are online, they're going to end up taking the exam. That's the deal on that. I'll make sure it's posted by Monday. So you have until end of the day on Wednesday to complete the exam. You guys that are doing the projects, it's going to be a lot more interesting. You're going to have fun because on Monday, on uh, Tuesday rather, I keep saying thing on Monday. On Tuesday, uh, when you guys come in here, um, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to print out your project, like six or seven pages. We're going to paste them to, paste them or, or, or pin them to post the board, and we'll each take a turn explaining what we did. Now. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about how do you choose the right statistical technique for the type of data that you're analyzing. And I'll go through several examples using the community health data set and so on and so forth. And we'll answer questions about, you know, what it should look like, what you should have in the project and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's take a break and we'll come back in 10 minutes, okay? No questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, of course you can answer your questions. I mean, like during the break, Sure. Actually, tell you two, three people have done it so far. There's an area where you can upload a description of your project. And I haven't done anything with that yet. I'm going to do it like starting now. I'll, if you upload it, I'll see that you upload. You get that little weird circle or something like that. I'll take a quick look at it. And I, I'm not going to grade it or anything like that, but I'll take a quick look at it. And if you're going completely off on the wrong, on a tangent, like you're using the wrong statistical test, I'll try and like straighten you out there. The other thing is, yeah, the other thing I also is to relax you a little bit is that when you give your presentation on Tuesday, right? Let's say that, gee, you made a big mistake there. You will still have the opportunity by end of the day on Wednesday or Thursday to upload a corrected version. And I'll review that as well. 
So don't feel like you're going to present it on Tuesday and I'm going to say, well, you did it all wrong. B, you know, you still have an opportunity. I'll point out a mistake or something like that. You'll have the opportunity to correct the mistake or whatever. Sure. That's not usually going to be the case. Most people do too much. Right. Remember, this, this is this is something that's going to fit on, you know, uh, that's that you're going to have like, you know, it's going to be stuff that like it's going to be printed out for maybe six, five, six, seven pages. That's going to be printed out, you know, on sheets of paper, eight and a half, 11 by sheets of paper that are the types going to be big enough for me to read from a couple of feet away. And I don't see that well. Right. So so we're going to talk like 18, you know, 18 point font or something like that, maybe 20 point font or something. So we're not talking about a lot of writing, a lot of data. I really would love if you, for instance, we're going to talk. Well, we're going to talk about it more, but I'm going to I'm going to encourage you to use graphics, you know, as well, histograms, uh, pie charts. Uh, 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 if you do, there's not much data that's numerical data, but if you did correlation, you know, like a, a, a scatter plot or something like that. Well, we'll talk about that when we come. Let's take a break. Okay, let's take a real break and then come back and we'll talk about it. Um, it's it should be yeah under assignments. There's a thing in there for you know for review for letting me review your your intended. Uh, Are you going to bring the board? Or we have to bring the board? I'm sorry. I'm bringing the board. Just bring the paper. I'll bring the push pins and the boards. Okay, it's not a science project. <laughs> it's not like high school where you bring a you make a volcano. <laughs> I'll bring the boards to put push put the push pins in and the push pins. Okay, good. I need a cup of coffee. I'll be right back. Oh, I have a question. Let me just see if I got a question here. Um, okay, we're assuming that the population is normally distributed. Only doing it. Yes. You know, uh, somebody online pointed something out here. I did not uh, uh, go over the PowerPoint does this better. That recording on the PowerPoint that's online that you can play on your own. Uh, and the PowerPoint does this a little bit better, tells, talks about the assumptions for this. And one of the assumptions is, is that the, uh, uh, the populations, the data, numerical data is based on, uh, that those are normally distributed or only slightly skewed. Okay, And if they are skewed, that the, you should have at least a decent sized sample. Decent sized samples usually considered at least 15 people for each uh, uh, numerical variable. So for two variables, uh, like we've been working with here, that would be at least 30 people, right? So or 30 values, 30 subjects. Uh, uh, and there's a couple of others as well. But, but yeah, that's one of the assumptions of this. Okay. I'm going to pause the recording. This conference <clears throat> will now okay, be Okay, we're back on. So let's take a look at the uh, data sets that we have for the project and what the project consists of. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So on the project, what we're trying to emulate on the project is a poster presentation. And I think I've shown you some pictures of them before. Let me just go online here quickly, pull one up. This is what a formally uh, presented and professionally printed poster uh, uh, looks like. And they have these at professional organizations all the time. The American Public Health Association's annual meeting, uh, Industrial Hygiene Association's annual meeting, so on and so forth. And there are oh, actually, it is a good one here. Literally, there might be hundreds of these posters being pre presented. And this is because uh, they'll have a number of presentations of research and uh, um, um, uh, information exchange and so on and so forth, presentations being done at conferences. There's never enough time 
or space for everybody to present all the research that they've been doing. So American American Public Health Association may be tens and tens of thousands of people showing up for them, uh, maybe thousands of them that are actual researchers that have stuff that they want to present. So what you're seeing behind me, I think, you're seeing a, a uh, rows and rows of these boards where people have put their posters, have uh, put their posters up. And they're standing next to them. Typically, they'll be standing next to them something like this. Here's a person, a couple of people, smiling. They'll be smiling all the time, of course. Right? And their posters describe the research that they've done, the conclusions that they've come to, what they plan on doing in the future. So um, I'll say I'm interested in one of the areas that I have quite a bit of work in is Legionnaire's disease. There's a lot of research being done on Legionnaires' disease, a lot of new laws, regulations coming about, so on and so forth. Uh, there's new, uh, there's new uh, uh, tests uh, for a Legionella. There's new tests for, uh, uh, there's a, there's a uh, short-term uh, uh, urine test for testing a person who has pneumonia to see if they have Legionnaires' disease. It's like 90% accurate or something like that. 90, remember we, at the beginning of the semester, we were talking about sensitivity. Sensitivity is like 90%, it identifies cases of Legionnaires' disease, so they can start the appropriate uh, antibiotic response to that, and so on. So it's very important. Also, it, it helps us collect statistics on Legionnaires. That's important. All these new developments are important to me. So if I might be one of the people that's walking up and down these rows, and there might be research on um, uh, public health interventions and diabetes, there might be research on uh, educational uh, endeavors, and so on and so forth. Each one of these researchers has their research, their area of interest, um, uh, summarized on these posters. And uh, as I walk through here, I may come across a poster that uh, 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 where a researcher is, um, is um, uh, researching the effectiveness on uh, uh, predicting which cooling towers might have Legionella in them. In other words, based on location, based on, based on temperature they operate, based on a number of other things, so you don't have to be quite as reliant as biological tests, which take two weeks to get a result, right? Or maybe somebody has a uh, 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 a, uh, a protein uh, phosphorescent protein test that can give you a quick answer on whether or not Legionella are in the, uh, present in the cooling tower, and so on and so forth. They'll present that on that board. So I may walk past ten of these or twenty of them, and then see that piece of research they're working on, read that poster, and if he's there, actually discuss his research with him and may get, maybe get some other insights in it. So a great way to communicate information. A lot of that information contains statistics. They're what their test was, what the results of their tests were, you know, how effective it was, how effective an intervention was, and so on. And a lot of it also contains graphics as well. So let me see if I can't, here, let's see if we can get. So here's a poster, let me see if I can't get one there. So a little bit more graphics on it. Let's take a look at that one. There you go. Okay, so here, what do we have here? We have an introduction to what their objective is, what they're talking about. They have like some sort of picture here that I guess has some relevance to this. I'm not sure what it is. I, I'm not sure it's even necessary, but they're discussing their objective, what their what this what their research is about. And then they're presenting some some descriptive statistics. They're showing us pie charts, they're showing us bar charts. Your case may show you may show us a histogram or two or something like that, and they're showing us tables that they either made in Excel or in SPSS or some other statistical software that summarizes the information that they're working with. In your case, you may describe, for instance, um, if you're working with the community health uh, data set, you may describe your objective. I want to investigate um, whether or not people that um, are left-handed are more likely to get a flu shot, right? And that's what I'm really I'm interested in researching. And you might, while you're here in this introduction, you might try and do a little bit of a search for studies that have looked at influenza and left-handedness in terms of, you know, whether or not uh, people get flu shots and so on, right? So, you know, at least it would be nice if you would pull up, if you would at least reference at least one or two papers, not 20 not 40, one or two references in there 
to information, uh, you know, some background that you you've at least looked at the background of what you're trying to study. Now, does that mean Wikipedia? No, that means like a real paper. You know, okay, not Wikipedia, not Quora. What's that thing? Quora, where you put a question on them, he answers it and stuff, right? Not not that, but a real you know real professional research, right? So you know, it'd be nice if you research that and, and you know find a couple of those and just mention it there and reference it there and so on. And then you might want to, let's say that's what you're doing. Now you might want to give us some background on your population, some descriptive statistics. In other words, left-handedness and uh, uh, influenza. What things might be interesting is to know about the population? Well, gee, you know, maybe we'd be interested in knowing what percentage of the population is left-handed or right-handed, right? It's that simple, right? A bar chart, right? Left hand, right hand, or a pie chart. Uh, what percent? What? What? Uh, what's the age range of the population? That's interesting in community health survey because there are no no people, there are no children, nobody under eighteen in that, right? You could show a histogram that shows the distribution of the population in the, in the, uh, uh, of this at the, of that sample in the community health survey, and it'll see on the graph there's nobody under eighteen on that histogram, right? So you get some information from it. You might want to show uh, the percentage of males and females. Right or so on and so forth. The percentage of people that got a flu shot overall, and so on. And then you may want to, and then after that, you may want to apply a statistical test. You may want to tell us what you're going to prove and the appropriate test. So, for instance, in that case, you're looking for whether a person is left-handed or right-handed, and whether or not they got a flu shot. Right. Well, those are two categorical variables, and they're both dichotomous. I mean, they got two values right-handed, the left-handed, and got a flu shot, didn't get a flu shot. So in that case, you would use chi-square. You would build a contingency table and give us the contingency table. Show us the, at, the observed values. You know, how many people in the community health survey were left-handed and got a flu shot, left-handed didn't get a flu shot, right-handed got a flu shot, right-handed didn't get a flu shot. And then to show, you know, tell, you know uh, uh, most of the time in these things, they, you will not put a null and alternative hypothesis, right? You'll, you'll go through your statistics and your results in, in, and uh, announce your results that the result was statistically significant to this level, p-value, significance value, and so on and so forth. You wouldn't actually say a null and alternative hypothesis. For our, for our case, it wouldn't hurt to do that, right? To give me what your null and alternative hypothesis is, because we're really kind of doing this as an exercise for a class, so it would be good for you to do that on here, because then I could comment on it and say, gee, I, I think that's a good way to phrase it, or maybe that you should really do the null term of hypothesis a little bit differently, format it a little bit differently or something like that. And again, don't worry that you, remember, you're gonna get a chance to correct it if I comment on it. Okay, so um, um, uh, you have, yeah, so you have this, uh, so you're dealing with that part of it. Then give us the statistics, give us the results, show us the table, show us the chi-square value, uh, the table from SPSS, maybe you don't like it. It's not very attractive. You want to redo it in, in PowerPoint. Or you want to redo it in Excel or something like that to make it a little bit more interesting looking. Okay, you know, put some colors in it, you know, I don't know, pictures, whatever you want to do with it. You know, you can be creative with this if you want. So give us your, what statistical test, your null alternative hypothesis, optional, but better if you do it. Tell us what statistical test that you applied to these, what your variables were, right? And then go ahead and do the test, give us the table, the results of the test, the tables, the odds ratio, the confidence intervals, whatever, you know, uh, the, are appropriate to that. And then give us a discussion and conclusion based on the statistical test that you did. In other words, maybe, you know, uh, left-handers were statistically more like, remember, this is a giant data set. This is 8,000 people. And, and uh, 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 left-handers were statistically more likely to get a, a flu shot than right-handers were. However, the difference was 17.1% of left-handers and 17.2% uh, of right-handers, even though it was statistically different, it wasn't clinically significant. It wasn't that big a difference that, that like you would you know, go out of your way to... to to uh, target your education on flu shots to right-handers or something like that, because numerically it wasn't that big a difference. Might have been statistically significant, or maybe not, right? You would <coughs> determine that. 
There's no requirement that your result has to be statistically significant. You can just report, well, I did the analysis and I did all this work and research, and then it came up, I, it wasn't statistically significant, I wasted all this time. That's gonna happen to you in the future. It doesn't have to happen here. It doesn't have to happen here. Whatever you do, even if it turns out not to be statistically significant, just report that, discuss it, discuss whether or not you think it's because the sample was skewed or it wasn't enough people or too small sample, or maybe you know there, were, there was really no association. So it's not surprising that that happens. You don't have to, you don't have to get a statistically significant result. Just get a result. Do the right test with the right kind of data and get the right result is what we're after. Okay, and discussion and results. So basically, it might look something like this, right? Theirs is a lot prettier, right? It's been printed by a, a professional, right? It's, uh, it's laid out. I like the way it's laid out. You're not going to be able to quite resize your boxes like that because you're stuck with a eight and a half by 11 sheet. It can, you can, you can, remember you, you were going to, you know, clip them to the board. One's going to, you know, connect to the next one. So you can, if you want, you can overlap onto the next page. You know, so, uh, you know, because, you know, imagine we're taping them up or something like that, right? So I would say six, seven pages with this size print. See the size print that you have on there? That size print. This kind of material, look how they summarize their data. You know, over here, there's a little bit more text over here. But we're not talking, we're not, we're talking maybe, I don't know, what, what do you think is there? 500 words total on this thing? 600, 700? We're not talking, you know, thousands of words. We want a summary. We want, we want you to uh, uh, summarize uh, your objective and some background information about what you're, what you're looking at. We want to see some descriptive statistics about the population and, and the particular and descriptive statistics about the variables that you're looking at, left-handedness and, and flu shots. And then we would like to see, we'd like you to tell us what, you are, what you're going to prove right? What statistical test you're going to use? What variables? Now, it could be two variables, could be six variables. You can do nine statistical tests. You're not going to get extra credit for doing nine statistical tests because you'll drive me crazy, right? So, so uh, 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 you don't have to do a lot. If you want to do a little extra, if something that you're doing with these two variables leads you to say, you yeah, know, let me take a little uh, look a little bit further. That would be great. That would be really nice. And you do some additional tests. You could do that as well. And then conclusions and, and rec uh, conclusions and discussions. You know, we, we continue there. In other words, what was the result what, in English? What was the result that you got? What is it? You know, and uh, discussions. What does it mean? You know. Okay, you guys comfortable with that? Because I want to go through some examples. Yes. 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 I mean, the data was on. Provided for us, so I don't yeah. Well, hang on a second. Let's see what the let's see what was provided for you. Okay, that's 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 a tough one. Let's see what was provided for you. We have a whole bunch of data sets here. We have this community. Actually, I only gave you a CSV file for, not, for R for this one. I'm gonna I'll, I'll put up a, a, a um, SPSS version of that as well. But you got a data set here that's got 2013 Community Health Survey, right? So if I download that, I'm sure I have it on here. As a matter of fact, CHS. 2013. Uh, uh, here's the full version, and here's the simplified version. I'm going to open up the full version first. Okay, SPSS churning in the background there. Did you turn on recording? I guess I did. Let me get to it. Is it open yet? Up oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. Okay, when I look at the full version here, what do I get? There it is back there. What do I get when I look at the full version? Here's the data set. Notice it's all numbers. It's not any actual data in there, right? Not, not. It doesn't describe to you what these numbers mean. This number demog one. Demog one. Wait, I just saw it there. This number demog one. I happen to know that that's the age. Right, that's a person's age. Call it demog one, demographic one. Right. So these are the subjects' age. How many subjects are there? Well, let's see. Let's scroll down here and see how many subjects there are. 
there's eight, I'm not going to go all the way around. There's 8,000 people in the survey. There's a lot of people in the survey. How many variables are there? Remember, this is, these are questions they were asked. How many variables are there? I'm going to go into the variables view. There are, here's the, uh, there's, here is the, uh, the variable name, and you have the variable label. The variable label is the question that they ask. So this, this uh, soda size, when you drink sugar, sugar sweetened soda, what size do you usually drink? Sounds like a numerical variable. Um, 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 here, there's 209 questions, 209 variables in here, right? Uh, okay. Do you have any unaltered cats that are allowed outdoors? Yes or no? Why did they ask that question? I have no idea why they asked that question on a community health survey. I can I can imagine why they might ask if they if you have a cat, because maybe. Hey, let's see if people who have cats are more likely to have asthma, right? That may, you know, maybe I, you know, but they didn't ask that. They asked, do you have any unaltered cats that you allow outdoors? Maybe you can use that anyway, because that's at least the key to the person who has a cat, right? If they didn't ask, there might be another place here where they asked, right? That's a categorical variable. Do you have unaltered cats that go outside? Yes or no? Maybe that has some sort of behavioral significance. People that are, maybe this is to track down crazy cat ladies, you know, something like that. And they want to look at, remember there at the beginning there, you know, it's a bunch of variables about mood. Have you ever been to, to, you know, diagnosed with depression uh, during the last 30 days? How, uh, how often did you feel nervous? So on and so forth. Right? So there's a number of different kinds of variables here. Numer so if you, most of them are categorical. There are some numerical variables where people report a number like age, number of times that you felt nervous in the past 30 days and so on. Okay. Um, type of health insurance, right? Uh, now, if I go to, see, that's insure 13. That's the 23rd variable. If I go to that variable, insure 13, I'm going to go across carefully. Here's insure 13. Uh, what are the values? I, I see a three, a four, a one, a five. There's at least five different vari five different values there. How do I know what those values mean? Okay, now if you look a little further on our data set there on Blackboard. Oh, I'm getting a very busy uh, page here. If we go back here. We also gave you the code book. Code book is a PDF file. I'm going to open that right now. Okay, and uh, uh, actually I want to download it. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna open it in a new window. Get the best of both worlds. Okay, here's my here's my code book right here, right? And this code book gives you the questions, and it also gives you how the data was coded. So in short, thirteen. Did I go past it already? I you know I can't I I should have just made sure. 13. So let me do it. There it is. Insure 13. I don't know what page it wound up being. I wound up being on page. I, I went right past it. Okay. What does that mean? Well, let's see. One, where are the values? I don't have the values here. Access to health insurance. One means employer insurance. Two means self purchase. Three means Medicare. Four means uh, Medicaid. Uh, five means. Uh, uh, I don't know what that is. That's a different kind of insurance. Six means COBRA. Seven means uninsured. The letters are, uh, the, the letters D, R, it's that they're, they're going to be ignored by SPSS. So you don't have to worry about that. It will eliminate those, val those, those, those subjects. So it won't do. So you have seven different values. How do, you, how do you get that information into SPSS? Well, you go into SPSS. You, you, you note that that's how that variable is structured. You go into SPSS, which is the way to go, this one, I think, which is this one. And uh, you go into the variables view. You go to insure 13. There's your question, type of health insurance. You could rephrase that, right? You're, you could leave that type of health insurance, or you could rephrase it just into health insurance. Remember, these labels are going to wind up on your tables. And then you go into values. Click into values. Notice a box opens up. 
And you can tell it that one, the value one, come on, let me click in there. Why is it not cooperating? The value one represents employer health insurance. Okay, and the value two represents, I don't know what it is, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call it Medicare. Value three represents self-purchased. And why are you doing this? You're doing this because then when you create a chart or you do an analysis, do a chart or you, create, you do an analysis, it will recognize that that's what that one stands for. And instead of putting one down for the type of insurance or three or seven, it's going to put the type of insurance. So how, so type of insurance and flu shot, let's say you wanted to analyze that. You could do a chi-square because you have a category variable, which is the type of insurance, and you have a outcome, which has got a flu shot, didn't get a flu shot. There is a variable on there for that. You're gonna wind up with a table that's seven by two. You're not gonna be able to do odds ratios because it only works for two by two tables, right? However, you will be able to determine what percentage of people uh, have uh, uh, get a flu shot that, that uh, have Medicare or self-employer uh, insurance or COBRA and so on and so forth. You'll be able to look at the differences in the rates, right? Because you can get that from the percentages by rows on that on the chi-square table, on the cross tabs table, right? You can also calculate a chi-square value. What would be your null hypothesis? Null hypothesis is that the, uh, uh, that the type of insurance does not affect the rate at which uh, people get uh, influenza immunization. And your alternative hypothesis is, is that it does affect it, right? And you can then see if you get a statistically significant result uh, to either reject the null hypothesis or not reject the null hypothesis. Now, then you could say, hey, you know, now that I've done that, I'm gonna take a closer look. I am going to see if there is a, uh, a variable in here that says, insured or not insured, not all different kinds, just insured, not insured, and see if there's a difference between just having insurance and not having insurance overall. And that would be a two by two table, right? Insured, yes or no. Columns would be insured, uh, would be uh, influence of vaccine, yes or no. Right? So you could do it as a two by two table too, if that variable exists. So you have two sets of data here. You have this community health survey here. Look at all the good stuff they have in here. They even, believe it or not, have stuff on nutrition in here. Now, if you guys are working with a data set in another class, a nutrition class, and it's in this format where you have the actual subjects and so something that you could put into SPSS, if you have that, you're perfectly welcome to use that. Be a good idea to maybe like, you know, put it on Blackboard in that area in Blackboard so I can preview it, you know, and, and talk to you about it. But you could, you're perfectly welcome to use your own data sets instead of the ones that I've proposed, especially if it's something you're doing in another course or, or if it's something that's in more in your area of interest. But there is stuff in here on, uh, on, uh, di on diet and nutrition, especially sugar. Uh, how often do you drink? Here, um, um, uh, uh, what does that say? N soda per day, 13. How often do you drink sugar, sweetened soda? Right? Um, average number of sodas per day. Uh, so on and so forth. How about fruit? Let me search for fruit. Uh, thinking about nutrition one. Thinking about nutrition. How many total servings of fruit and vegetables did you eat yesterday? Serving with blah, 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 so on and so forth. Um, uh, and then let's see if I got some more. What is this? I'm sure there's going to be so. How about exercise? You can go through the, the uh, this table. Past 30 days, other days, in rate, did you participate in any physical activities? Past 12 months, how often have you ridden a bicycle? Uh, during the past seven days, did you walk at least 10 minutes at a time to get from places to places? Right. Now that, that's going to be yes, no, two values, just yes and no. In other words, if you didn't walk at least 10 minutes at a time to get from place to place over the last seven days, that would be an indication that you lead a very sedentary lifestyle, right? So basically, 
one yes and two no is you lead a very and it's kind of a kind of a proxy for you do you lead a sedentary lifestyle or not right so or maybe you're disabled or something like that right so you might want to see if there's an association between a sedentary lifestyle and mood let's go back to mood at the beginning for instance mood you might want to see if there's during the past 30 days uh there, 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 let's see Let me find something that's dichotomous maybe In the past 12 months, have you taken a prescription medication for a mental health problem? Yes and no. So you can see if there's a correlation between act, physical activity and whether or not a person has been prescribed a mental health prescription during the past 12 months. There's any amount of wealth of information here you're, you're perfectly willing to use. Now, one of the things I might, if you're gonna do this, once you've kind of settled on which, which variables that you wanna use, so for instance, I might say to myself, okay, uh, uh, I want to work with, I'm going to go to uh, insured, type of health insurance, type of health, five categories, type of health, insured, uninsured. I think, I think that one is just, just whether you're insured or not. Let's say I want to work with those three variables. Or the insurance variables. I don't need these others, right? I can go up there. I can highlight them. I can say clear. Get rid of them. You can always go back if you need them again. You can always go back and open this again. I'm going to keep those insured ones, and then I'm going to say, let's say, I want to work with like whether people are smokers or not. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of all of this. Clear. So I got insurance and smoking status. Here's some more smoking stuff. Uh, type of smoker, so on and so forth. I'm going to keep those variables on smoking and insurance. I'm going to get rid of everything else. Highlight them to say clear. And now I only have the variables I'm interested in. You could eliminate more of these if you want, right? If you're interested in eliminating them. So, so, so you get to choose what you're going to work with. This makes things a little easier. In fact, you might only want to work with what I got here. Okay, let's see on insurance. On insurance, these are ones and twos. I'm gonna be I'm gonna bet that insured is whether you have insurance or don't have insurance. So I'm gonna just work with that one. So I'm gonna eliminate these other two insurance. Okay. And I'm gonna get rid of these, this one. Okay, and then I'm gonna smoking status. Smoke every day versus some days. How about type of smoker? How long has it been since you last smoked? Smoke every day versus only smoking some days. A smoking status, I wonder what smoking status is. See, smoking status, that has three values in it. I'm gonna use those two, okay? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and use those two. I'm gonna give you an example of how I would approach this. I'm gonna go to variable view. I'm gonna get rid of all these others. Okay, so now I'm going to go to my, I'm going to go to my code book, and I'm going to look up what those values, what that question was, and what those values are. Okay, so you're looking over my shoulder as I'm doing what you'll probably be doing with maybe other variables. I'm going to go to insured. Insured. Did I get it right? I should have downloaded it to make it a little easier. Insured. Here's a variable insured. Insured, one represents yes, two represents no. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and categorize that. Uh, insurance status. I may change the label to insurance status, or just insured uninsured. Get rid of the rest of that junk. Insured uninsured, and the values are going to be one is yes. And two is no. And for smoker, smoking status, 
Uh, if I go back to that, uh, uh, I don't need this anymore. Go back to my, where is it, where is it, there it is. Smoking status. I didn't find it, smoking status. Here we go, every day. Smoke every day versus some days. Uh, have you ever smoked at least 100 cigarettes in your life? Do you now smoke? Well, let me take a look at what that one is. I'm sorry I eliminated that one. Now. Yeah, one, two, and three for current, former, and so on. Well, that's the one I got. That's the one I saved. So one is never smoked. Two is current smoker, and three is a former smoker. So I can go in here and tell it that one is current smoker. Oops. Two is never smoked. And three is former smoker. Okay, so let's see what I have now. What I have now looks like this. Insured, uninsured, and so on and so forth. So let's say that one of the things I'm interested in showing is that uh, I want to know whether smokers uh, uh, are more likely or less likely to have insurance. Okay, so these are both categorical variables, right? Both categories. So how am I going to display this? Let me think. Smokers, two categorical variables. What kind of test do I use for those? I use chi-square and odds ratio, right? So I'm going to say analyze. I'm going to say descriptive statistics cross tabs, right? Because that's how I get into, uh, I organize the data. And in the rows, I am going to put um, um, their smoking status. And in the outcomes, the columns, I'm going to put whether or not they're insured or not. Okay, you can look at this other ways as well, right? You could look at the other way around. You could say to yourself, well, if you're uh, if you're insured, what's the likelihood that you are a smoker or a former smoker? I'm going to look at it this way. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to go into cells, and it's going to give me the observed values. It's actually just going to organize it into, into tables. I'm going to ask it for percentages by rows. I'm going to click OK. See what comes up. So here's our table. Our table tells us that uh, in this survey, um, 4,950 people out of 5,500 uh, 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 told us that they were not, that they do not current, that they are current smokers. That's 17.7% .7 of the population that this, uh, of this sample in New York City, 17.7% .7 of people in New York City or in this year appear to be smokers, right? How many of them never smoked? Well, that's 19.9%. That's and former smokers was 10.8%. And I don't know, I guess the others just didn't answer the question. Uh, count. Yeah, I guess the others just didn't answer that question. All right, so, so let's see. The percentage of smokers 17.7, non-smokers, uh, never smoked is 19.9 in the survey. That's kind of weird. Uh, 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 so now the, oh, I'm sorry. I, no, I'm sorry, I got this wrong. I have to go back and I have to step back again and explain this table. In the rows is smoking status. In the columns is insurance status. So if your current smoker, right? 4,400 out of 5,300 smoke uh, people who are current smokers are insured. 82.3% of smokers are insured. Now I got it straight. See, that's what happens when you look at these tables for too long. How, what about people that are not insured? Among people that are not insured, 981 out of 1,200, not that many people are uninsured, right? 80% uh, of them that are non-smokers or never smoke are insured. And then among former smokers, it goes back up again to 89% of former smokers are insured. Well, that's interesting. What does that mean? Why would smokers be more likely to have insurance than non-smokers? More health problems, yeah. Maybe they maybe they have to be careful to get insured because they have more health problems. 
What else? Maybe they're concerned. They don't have problems. With, they're concerned about having health problems. Maybe people who are employed are more likely to be smokers. Maybe I, I, you can go through, you can like speculate on this, see if there's any data, any studies on smoking status and insurance status. You know, research it a little bit. See if you can come up with something. You might be able to, you might not be. If you can't come up, just let me know. If you can't come up with anything or you found just a little bit of information or something like that. So that's pretty interesting. What statistical test can we apply here? What's our null hypothesis? Our um, null hypothesis is there's no association between insurance status and whether or not you smoke. That's our null hypothesis. What's our alternative hypothesis? There is an association, right? What test do we, uh, do we use to prove that there's an association? That's our chi-square test, right? So I'm gonna go over here to analyze, descriptive statistics, cross tabs, and then I'm gonna go into statistics and I'm gonna click off chi-square. I'm also gonna pick, click off risk, but we're gonna see there's a problem there. I'm gonna say continue and say okay. This is going to calculate a, a in the background, it's going to calculate an expected values table from our observed values table and give us the chi-square, and calculate the chi-square value. The chi-square value for a two by two table, I'm sorry, it's not a two by two table. It's a three by two table, current, never, and former. Three rows, two columns. That's three minus one is two. One mi two minus one is one. Two times one is two degrees of freedom. So for two degrees of freedom, our chi-square value is 59. That's a really big number. The probability that we would get that big a chi-square value if the null hypothesis was true is less than one-tenth uh, one of a percent. It's less than 0 0.001. That means we can reject the null hypothesis and say that we reject the null hypothesis and no association between insurance and uh, 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 status in smoking and accept the alternative that there is an association, right? Statistically significant association between the two of these that whether or not a smoker or you're insured has to have that, that there's some association there, right? So that's an interesting result. I have no idea what that means, right? You might, this kind of thing might come up and you say to yourself, gee, let me think about this. What does this mean? Now, remember, I, I also clicked off risk, which would ordinarily give me an odds ratio and a relative risk, another table. What does it say there? Risk estimates cannot be computed. They are only computed for a two by two table with empty cells, right? So with no empty cells. So this is a three by two table. You can't do odds ratio. Remember odds ratio is this, this divided by this over this divided by this. So since there's extra data there, it can't do it. How might you get around that? Let's say you're only interested in current smokers and non-smokers and people who never smoke. You know what I could do? I could go in here I can make up a new variable. Here's current smokers, right? Here's, here's smokers, current, former, and never smoked. I can go up here to transform, and I can say recode that into a new variable. And I could tell it, take this smoking status and uh, uh, make a new variable. I'm going to call that smoking, smoking, smoker two. I'll give it another name. Uh, 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 smoker, yes or no? Uh, smoker, yes or never? Current or never? How about that? I'll give it the label smoker, current, or never. I'm only interested in people that are current smokers or never smoked, right? So I can go in here, old values and new values, and I can say if the old value was a one, in other words, a current smoker, make the new value of one. And uh, let's see. Good. Let's see. Add. And if the old value were, uh, uh, what was the second one? Was it never smoked or was it uh, anybody? Can anybody tell me? Was it two never smoked or current smoker? I think two was never smoked, right? Two is a two never smoked. Add. Okay, and then three, I'm not gonna transfer over. I'm not gonna give it a value in the new one. So when I click continue and say, uh, 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 let's see, change, go ahead and change it, say okay, it creates a new variable with only those two values. I'll go back to my table here, there's a new, there it is. And I can go in here and I can code this and tell it smoker, uh, okay, and our value label is gonna be one for a smoker, 
and two for non-smoker. Okay. Now I'm going to look at that. I'm going to analyze descriptive statistics, cross tabs, and I'm going to say instead of using the smoking status, that original variable, I'm going to use my new variable, smoker current or never. And I'm going to click. And remember, this is I still have statistics. I still have a chi squaring risk clicked off. I say OK. It creates our new two by two table. There's a new two, two, two by table. Smokers, 82% of smokers, 82.3% of smokers are insured, while non smokers, 80.1% of them are insured. Right? And the chi square value is a one degree of freedom. The chi square value is 3.145. The significance is 0 0.07. It's not less than 0 0.05. So, what happened here? Among people that are non-smokers versus smokers, I was not able to prove to statistical certainty that there was an association between smoking status and whether or not you, uh, you had health insurance. Why might that be? Why did I get this result now? That could be because you know people that are former smokers, they could be anything. People smoke for a day, people smoke for a year. People that smoke for 40 years, that could be really confounding the data a bit. But among people that smoke currently and people who never smoked, right, it doesn't seem that there's a significant difference between the rate at which they're insured. So there's another interesting result. Got two interesting results. Would I throw either one of them out? No, I'd present them both. What the hell? Right? One of them led to you questioning it and going to the other one. You don't have to go this far. You don't have to you know, have a string of these things and stuff like that. Just one analysis and the, just the right test, the right, the right kind of variables and so on and so forth. How about odds ratio? Look at the odds ratio. The odds ratio, according to this, is the odds of having insurance if you're a smoker is 1.53 times as great than if you're a non-smoker. So 15% more likely if you're a non-smoker. However, is that statistically significant? Let's take a look at the confidence interval. The confidence interval includes one. One is inside that confidence. So since one is not outside the confidence interval, you can't say that the odds ratio is, even though it came up 1.15, you can't say that statistically, with statistical certainty, it's different than one. And one means no difference between the rates. So, so there's a lot of stuff you can do with this. You have that data. You have an abbreviated set of this data. Let me open that up. Right, and that abbreviated set of this data gives you, you have only the, yeah, let's see, I don't know where it saved it to. I'll, I'll tell you what, it's probably up here somewhere. Nope. Yeah, where is it? Where the hell did it go? Uh, let's see, my downloads, where is it? Downloads it here. I use four different browsers. I use Firefox for Blackboard. I use Safari for most of my other stuff. I use Chrome for YouTube. I use uh, Opera, what I forget what the other one is for something else, because I have all my different, it's, I have them set up so it works best with that, right? So, but I, you know, when I go back and forth, I forget where to find things. Okay, so, uh, let's see. Oh, so this is our abbreviated data set, right? In this case, we've given you the coding. Right, we're holding your hand a little bit there. I would really like if you can went into the main data set, played around with it, you got it, you got, you experimented, you figured out how to code things from the code book, you got it, you got really excited and you and you decided to like maybe transform and create a new variable. That would be great. Is that required? No, that's not required. Right. So you have this alternative, you have this data set that we've created for you that uh, uh, that has uh, 10 variables in it, right? Variables like, uh, let's see what we got. We got the subject's age, right? So if you want, you could do a t-test if you want, or analysis of variance. The borough that they live in, that's categorical. It's got five values. And we filled in for you that one is the Bronx, two is Brooklyn. So you could look at, you know, uh, 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 whether or not a person is insured or uninsured by, by their borough, by their rates, ethnicity, their neighborhood, the rate of poverty in their neighborhood. Um, uh, you could look at uh, whether or not they received the flu shot or not, the type of health insurance that they had, 
uh, uh, the number of children that they have living in their household and so on and so forth. So you can take a look at a number of these different things. We summarize that into 10 uh, uh, variables that if you didn't want to get adventurous and work with the main code book, you have that data available to you. Okay? Yes? Let's say you work with a simplified Yes. 10 variables. You can show the 16. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So so if you feel if you feel timid about coding and stuff like that and like and manipulating the data set and stuff like that, you can stick with that. But I'd encourage you to like look through, especially because you're not specialists in the flu. You guys are nutrition people, right? There's data in there on people's diet, on people's exercise habits, on people's health, on their mood, on so on and so forth. There's all sorts of other information in there. Go spin through, you know, go look at the code book. Let's bring through and see if there's a couple of interesting questions that were asked there. Okay, and play around with it. And then if you have real problems with that, you can always fall back to the simplified data set if you want. Okay, so how are you guys online doing there? Right? Have I scared you to death? Right? This is, like I said, don't get too nervous about this whole thing. Because when you when you present your research on Monday and Tuesday, right? If there's an issue, you all point it out. You know, well, you know, maybe you should have used this other test. Or maybe it would have been better. Maybe you could put a little bit more. You really didn't tell us too much about some background on this population that's relevant. You know, maybe you need a little bit more descriptive. Maybe you need this. Maybe uh, you can research it. Maybe get get me a you know footnote from some article, or you know, find an article that like uh, uh, looks at this a little bit more closely or something. I'll bring it up, and you'll have a couple of days where you can have until I I I, I can give you until. The end of the day on Thursdays, absolute deadline because I gotta get grades. The grades go have to go in almost like right away. You have to right like uh, just a day after Christmas or something like that. So even before that, and I can't depend on that because if I miss the date, I have to do a change of grade for everybody in this class, which has to be signed by the head of the department and your advisor, right? And if I miss getting that grade deadline in there, I'm gonna get real heat. You know, so because they're not going to want to do all that paperwork and stuff like that. So, so I really can't stretch it any more than that. Okay. Uh, in over the next couple of days, I'll start looking. I haven't started yet, but over the next because there are only three people uploaded something so far. But over the next couple of days, certainly by the weekend, I, I will have gone. You know, certainly by the start of the weekend, I will have at least glanced at them, giving you a little bit of feedback. Okay, but remember, when you present on Tuesday, that's also feedback, because you can also modify it a bit and upload it then. Yes? I'm still confused. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, just about the method. I don't know what to do. Like, I'm just having a different section, the introduction, the results. Yeah. The methods, I don't... The methods, the kind of the test that you're going to use. In other words, first thing you want to do is pick out your variables. Uh -huh. Pick out, you got 10 variables there. Do you, uh, you have the one that the abbreviated one open now? Yeah, open up the abbreviated one, one with only 10 variables. Let me make sure I got mine open here. Yeah, the simplified, so I'm gonna go into the variable view. Look at the variable view. You see the questions, see behind me, you can see the questions. Right, so the question, the variable view, you can see the questions. Subjects age, borough of, of residence, race, neighborhood, uh, insured or uninsured, type of health insurance, uh, received a flu shot, sex, male or female, uh, nativity, that means whether you're born in the United States or not. Uh, number of children under 18 years living in the household, right? So which two variables might you want to look at to see if there's an association? Well, I have a lot of insurance. Okay, flu shot and insurance. So where are those two? So so flu shot is where is that? Da, 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 da. Is it here? Number seven. Yeah, there it is. Receive flu shot, yes or no? Right. That's a yes or no, right? And are you insured? Yes or no? Right. So you have a yes or a no for flu shot. You have a yes or a no for insurance. Two by two. What kind of test is that? What kind of test would you use for a uh, two categorical variables? Odds ratio. Odds ratio, excellent, yeah. And? Risk ratio. Uh, and risk ratio, and also chi-square, right? Okay, so let's take a look at that. Let's see if they're associated. What would you use there? Let's take a look. Let's go to analyze. 
descriptive statistics, cross tabs. Okay, so which one would have be which one is the dependent variable, which one is the independent variable? In other words, which one would you think would affect the other? In other words, so since we're interested in whether or not a person would get a flu shot, we might be interested in seeing if they're insurance, if they're being insured would cause them to get a flu shot and encourage them to get a flu shot. So I would put into the rows the exposure or whether or not the person was insured. Move that in there. And in the columns, I would put in the outcome, whether or not they got a flu shot, received a flu shot. Okay? So now I'm going to click OK, and it's going to give me just a two-by-two two table. Okay, so two by two table. Let's see, insured was 3,500 3, people. At, there were 7,000 people who were insured. 3,500 of them got a flu shot. Among the insured people, there's 1,300 people, 1,400 people who uh, are, are, uh, are, don't have insurance. Only 318 of them got a flu shot. So it looks like if you're not insured, you're a lot less likely to get a flu shot, right? So you can expound on that. Now, and one of the things I could do with that, one of the things I could do with that, go into descriptive statistics, cross tabs again, and I could say, you know, yeah, let's go into cells. Show me the percentages by rows. Okay, I might not pick expected values. I mean, expected values might be interesting, but SPSS is going to do that calculation for you. So I'm going to click OK. See what happens now. What do I get now? And you can build these things, you know, like one step at a time if you want. 49% of people who were insured in this survey got a flu shot. Only 22.7 people were uninsured. Now let's go back, analyze descriptive statistics. Let's do some statistical analysis of this. It's nice we know that. Now let's prove it. What's our null hypothesis? Our null hypothesis is that being insured has no influence on whether you get a flu shot. There's no association between getting uh, being insured and getting a flu shot. Our alternative hypothesis, there is an association, right? So I'm gonna go to analyze descriptive statistics, cross tabs, and I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna click into cells. Let's do a statistical test to, to test that. And that statistical test is going to consist of, got the wrong button, chi-square. Oh, wait a second, it's a two by two table, so I can do odds ratio also. I'm gonna click continue, I'm gonna say okay. What do I get? Okay, so what I get is, Whoa, look at that Pearson's chi-square value. And look at the significance. There's a, it's obviously statistically significant. So I can reject my null hypothesis. There is an association between being insured and, and getting that. So now what could, you, what could you build around this? You could say to yourself, go online and research this and, and see if the government is uh, uh, encouraging people to get a flu shot, if they're targeting people who aren't insured or uh, what, what you know? See if there's a study of people and insurance and whether or not they get immunization in general. In other words, if their children miss immunizations because they're they're uh, uninsured, you know, or do they have other risks? The other risks are they more likely to get the flu if you're uninsured? Maybe there's some article somewhere that talks about you know whether or not a person uh, is likely to get the flu, or uh, they've done a study on you know, uh, uh, whether a person gets the, uh, gets the flu and whether or not they're insured or not, right? In other words, look, you know, do a little bit of background research and see if you can find some more information. Tell us, teach us about it, basically. Okay, right? so the method is the statistical test that I'm going to use. Yeah, that's right. The method is the, the, the statistical test, okay. right? So, so I would reject it. What about the risk estimate? Uh, the odds ratio and the risk and uh, relative risk is 2.177. What does that say? That says that you're twice as likely to get a flu shot if you have insurance. 2.1 times. What are the odds? The odds are 3.3 times as likely as the uh, for getting a flu shot uh, if you're insured versus if you're not insured. That's the odds ratio. And is that statistically significant? Well, look at the 95% confidence interval. It doesn't have one in between. So you can reject the no. What's the no hypothesis there? Odds ratio is equal to one. Relative risk equal one. What's the alternative hypothesis? Odds ratio does not equal one. Odds ratio does not equal uh, 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 relative risk does not equal one. You can reject the null hypothesis because you don't see one inside this confidence interval. Like, yes. So you're basically saying uh, described methods are used in data collection. Oh, you can. Yeah, you should talk about. You look at the code book. Look at the code book and and other stuff. 
and and discuss where this stuff come from. Uh -huh. That's what I mean by descriptive statistics. You know, give me a little bit of background. Where, where is this data? Where did it come from? Okay. You know, and and you can go on to the New York City Department of Health website and you can look this up. And you can see, oh, wait, this stuff came from a survey they do every year, and it's a phone survey, and they pay people to call people up, and these they got a list of questions, and this is how they do it. And by the way, you know, even though I'm only looking at insurance and and uh, uh, flu shots, whether or not a person got a flu shot, by the way, uh, uh, in this survey, you know, 54% of the people were females. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the the age range was this, and so it maybe show an Instagram for the age range, which you get from the age variable that's in there, right? So so you know, give me a little bit of background. Where where the hell did this stuff come from, and who are these people anyway? One significant thing is they're not surveying anybody under eighteen, right? Nobody under eighteen is represented in here, so we don't know anything about the insurance status of children, you know, in this survey at all. We don't know anything about the rate at which children get flu shots, right? That's significant because, you know, now, you know, if somebody asks you to do your poster and you're standing at the American Public Health Association, they come up to you and they say, oh, I'm so glad you did this survey. I'm researching exactly this, you know, because I really need to know, uh, you know, about insurance and flu shots for children. And you have to disappoint them and tell them, well, if you look over here on my descriptive thing, you'll see there's nobody under 18 in our histogram. That's because we only surveyed adults because of privacy concerns or something, right? So, you know, give a little bit of background so the person knows the population that you're working with. 